Lilith is a name that is often thrown alongside those of other evil and demonic characters in the Abrahamic religions like Satan, Beelzebub, and the Devil. From movies to video games to anime, the name has been given to countless female characters that are often depicted as evil, seductive demonesses, wearing skimpy bikinis, complete with devil horns, tail, and bat wings. With notable exceptions like whatever the heck this is. For the most part, the most common image is that Lilith is some kind of female demon that preys on sexual desire, though backstories to her origins are murky, from the devil's wife to his mother or his grandmother to his daughter to a former human turned demon to the Adam of Genesis' first wife before he had Eve. We, as a society, seem to kind of vaguely understand Lilith as the name of some kind of evil female spirit associated with Satan or the devil. But, at the same time, for the most part, we can hardly tell you where she came from exactly. People typically understand that the character is biblical in nature, but, like, is she even in the Bible? Who is this character of Lilith, and where exactly does she come from, and why has she become associated with sexy demons, as she has in popular culture of the modern day? Well, let's tackle this mysterious mythical creature on this installment of Trey Talks About Biblical History and Textual Analysis. I'll find a better name for this. Etymology, the name. The word Lilith comes from an ancient Hebrew word originally pronounced Lilith, a singular feminine noun. It probably has a common origin with the ancient Hebrew word Leila or Lelil and the Arabic word Lil, which both are Semitic words for night. And this shared origin with the word for night makes a lot of sense when we talk about the things associated with Lilith in the Bible later on. But the name's association with night is not all there is. A lot of Hebrew words share a common origin with the words of neighboring Mesopotamian languages like Sumerian and Akkadian. The word is incredibly similar and likely related to an Akkadian word Liliatu and a Sumerian one Lil, short for this monstrosity of a word. In both languages slash religions, the word was used to refer to a female night demon with the oldest mention of this demon going all the way back to the 3rd millennium BCE in the ancient Sumerian story Gilgamesh Enkidu in the Netherworld. In the story, there is a short passage where the Mesopotamian goddess Inanna plants a willow in a garden with the hopes of cutting it down and using its wood to create a throne and bed for herself. However, after 10 years of growth, she returns to the garden to find that three creatures have taken residence in the willow, a snake in the roots, a zoo bird building a nest for her eggs in the canopy, and the Lil creating a house or lair in the tree's trunk. The hero Gilgamesh is tasked with kicking out these squatters. He kills the snake, while the zoo bird and the Lil escape into the mountains and wilderness, respectively. Now, Mesopotamian folklore and traditions tell us a lot more about the Lilitu and Lil. Firstly, they were understood to be supernatural creatures, as opposed to natural ones like animals. They were anthropomorphic female demons. Both were associated with the wind and storms, and having poison instead of milk. They are often referred to as the ones who have no husband. It was often claimed that these female spirits, such demons, would visit men in their sleep through the window at night, and after finding an unfortunate male victim, typically younger unmarried men, they would seduce him and or kill him, much like the later medieval succubus demon of Europe. These demons were likely used to explain the natural phenomena of nocturnal emissions or wet dreams in the ancient world. Furthermore, they were treated somewhat as boogie women, sometimes being associated with taking young children from their mothers or causing pregnancies to fail. Much like many supernatural creatures in ancient history, Liliths and similarly named demons were used to explain natural occurrences through supernatural means. The Bible So, is this word Lilith even in the Bible? And if so, what does it mean exactly? Well, Lilith even outdoes the word Nephilim with its obscurity and scant use in the Bible, as the word appears only, drumroll please, once in the entire Bible. The Old Testament or Hebrew Bible book of Isaiah contains the Bible's only mention of this Lilith. Now, some Hebrew scholars have suggested that Lilith might be vaguely referenced in other locations in the Old Testament. However, she is not named, with Lilith possibly being the terror of the night. Psalm 91 verse 5 says not to fear. Isaiah 34, for the most part, is a prophecy concerned with God's wrath and future destruction of the kingdom of Edom, as a result of the Edomites sacking Jerusalem and killing Judeans under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. The author writes that the prophet Isaiah claims that Yahweh, the Hebrew God, will make the kingdom a desolate wasteland, killing all the nobility of the Edomites and making it like a desert, a home for the wild creatures. 
The Lord will stretch out over Edom a measuring line of chaos and a plumb line of destruction. No nobles will be left to proclaim a king, and all her princes will come to nothing. Her towers will be overgrown with thorns, her fortresses with thistles and briers. She will become a haunt for jackals, an abode for ostriches. Now, Isaiah 34.14 is where we get our brief Lilith cameo. And there shall the beasts of the desert meet with the jackals, and the wild goat shall cry to his fellow. The Lilith also shall settle there and find herself a place of rest. There shall the key paws make her nest, and lay, and hatch, and gather under her shadow. There also shall the vultures be gathered, one with another. Okay, so this passage in Isaiah is an English translator's worst nightmare, as it possesses two words that are never used anywhere else in the entire Bible. So, there are no other verses to really compare the meanings in the context of the sentence, which can be a real problem. In this passage, Lilith is mentioned alongside other creatures of the desert, both real and mythical, that will inhabit this desolate land of Edom once its human rulers are expelled slash killed by God and their former cities made vacant. The Lilith is said to be one of the beasts of the desert, translated as the beasts of the island in the Greek Septuagint text. Beasts that include jackals slash hyenas, the wild goat, sometimes translated as the satyr, the Lilith singular, the kipaz singular, and vultures, kites, or hawks. We can ascertain the overall image created for us in this text without really understanding what a lilith or a kipaz is exactly by just looking at the context that we do understand. Edom will become a desolate wasteland of a place for the scavengers and lowly creatures of the earth. It's just a piece of minor imagery to convey God's wrath and destruction, referencing these mythical creatures offhandedly. And for the most part, that's where we'd stop. But not us. What is a Lilith and a key pause exactly? The translation of Lilith into English in Isaiah 34.14 varies from Bible to Bible. Some translations simply translate Lilith as the night creature or the night monster. The English Standard Version translates Lilith as night bird with a little asterisk that says identity uncertain. The King James Version translates it as the screeching owl and some just leave it untranslated as Lilith. The key pause, which just like the word Lilith is only used once at this verse in the entire Bible, has a similar problem. Some translations leave it left untranslated as key pause, but others translate it as the great owl, while others still translate it as an arrow snake or darting snake, as in darting towards its prey. The word comes from an unused root word meaning to contract, i.e. spring forward like a snake. Perhaps more so than Lilith, the true meaning of this word is poorly understood and largely lost to history. Even the top Hebrew scholars seem to be at a loss for when it comes to understanding the kippahs. The Great Dictionary of Demons and Deities, a collaboration of the works of various Hebrew scholars and professors, rather unhelpfully both translates kippahs as possibly another word for serpent in Hebrew, as well as possibly an unknown type of bird. Based on this verse alone, it is unclear if either the Lilith or the Kipaws are mythical creatures or just strange names for known slash natural animals. These translations of these two words into English are perhaps the best guesses primarily based on the Hebrew roots of these words and the context of the verses. There isn't a lot of agreement between translators, so we might need to do a bit of sleuthing here. Textual Variant Funsies now, all these aforementioned translations of Isaiah 34, 14, and 15 are based on the ancient Hebrew Mesoritic text, or MT, created between the 7th and 10th centuries CE, itself being based off of the older, now lost copies of the original ancient Hebrew text of the Bible created thousands of years ago. But as we talked about in previous videos, the MT, the texts that most Christian Bibles are based off of, are not the only copies of these texts floating around, and we should look to these variant texts to try to infer what the true, original, now lost text might have said. There's been a lot of contention for hundreds of years around Lilith in particular. To complicate things, the Greek Septuagint, or LXX text of Isaiah 34:14, a 3rd and 2nd century copy based off of the original ancient Hebrew text, yields a slightly different translation. Translated into Greek from ancient Hebrew, it reads like this, And the, the demon shall, shall meet the onocentaurs, and they shall cry one to another. There shall the onocentaurs rest, having found for themselves a place of rest. 
Now we can see in this version the translators have streamlined this verse by simply referring to all the beasts of the desert or island as Ono Centaurs, with Lilith instead being translated as an Ono Centaur a Hellenistic mythical creature, similar to a typical centaur, but with a body part human and part donkey, instead of a horse. Now things are getting even more confusing when we look at the textual variants of the LXX version of Isaiah 34.14. Some Greek translators did not follow this Ono Centaur's translation, and opted to translate Lilith in other ways. Aquila of Sinope's Greek translation in the 2nd century CE leaves it untranslated as Lilith while Symmachus' Greek translation in the late 2nd century CE translates the word as Lamia, a female Greek demon that was once a beautiful woman but was cursed by the gods to be disfigured with serpentine qualities and would eat children and seduce and devour men with her enormous gullet. This translation of Lilith as Lamia continues in other copies of the Bible, particularly in the Latin Vulgate in the late 4th century CE. And the, and the demon, demon shall, shall meet, meet with monsters, monsters and one hairy one, one shall cry out to the other. There the Lemia has lain down and found rest for herself. The oldest text discovered of Isaiah 34.14, and probably the closest to the original, original ancient Hebrew text, is the great Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, created between 125 BCE and 68 CE. This text says something pretty much identical to what the Masoretic text says. But with one crucial difference, Lilith in this version is plural, Liliths, oh. as opposed to the singular Lilith found in the MT. For this reason, it appears in the original versions of Isaiah 34.14, it likely said Liliths plural, not Lilith. Bringing it all together. I know there was a lot of information there, and it can get a little crazy trying to keep track of the translations and meanings, but from all this information surrounding the Lilith, the image is starting to become clear here. First of all, it is apparent, based off of both early translations of Lilith into Greek, and from the words common origin and relationship with the Lil in Lilithu of Sumerian and Akkadian folklore, Lilith or Liliths in their original ancient context were very clearly understood to be magical, supernatural, or mythical creatures as opposed to a type of animal, such as an owl or a bird, as later English translators would suggest. The choice to translate Lilith as an Ono Centaur or Lamia by early LXX translators reflects this view, opting for a mythical interpretation over a natural one. Secondly, Lilith has a very, very clear relationship to various demonesses in neighboring folklores and religions of the time, Lil, Lemia, and so on. The Lil, seen in the Gilgamesh text and other Mesopotamian folklore, appears similar to the Lilith of the Isaiah verses, in not just name, but in actions and in imagery. Both creatures inhabit neglected or ruined slash desolate regions to make homes or lairs alongside various other creatures. The Lil, in Sumerian folklore, makes a home in the trunk of a willow, alongside snakes and zoo birds. A Lilith makes a home amongst the ruins of the cities of Edom, alongside jackals, vultures, satyrs or goats, and the mysterious bird snake-like key paws. The connection between Lilith and the Lil, or Lila too, couldn't be stronger, both linguistically and functionally. Additionally, if you noticed, the Lil and Lila too of Mesopotamia, female seductive demons that haunt young men and steal children, are remarkably similar to the Greek Lamia, to some a synonym for Lilith, who essentially does the same exact thing. Lil, Lilithu, Lamia, Lilith all seem to be just slightly different regional variations of the same demonic creature. The meaning of Lilith in its ancient context is very clear. Like Nephilim and Leviathan, Lilith is a Hebrew version of pre-existing mythical creatures, a Hebrew name for the same demon or type of demons. The ancient Jews were obviously aware of and knew of the mythical creatures from the stories of other neighboring religions and regions through cultural diffusion and sought to address them or Hebrewize them in their own sacred text and religion. Leviathan is just another name for Lotan or Tiamat or Typhon. Nephilim is just another name for the demigods of Greece and Mesopotamia. Lilith just seems to be another example of this. And this might perhaps explain the mysterious key paws as well as it might be a Hebrew version of the same serpent or zoo bird, or maybe a combination of both from the earlier Gilgamesh story of the willow tree. 
Lilith is a type of demon or evil spirit that haunts desolate areas at night, and likely seduced young men and stole children to the ancient Hebrews. And a lot of evidence supports this mythical demoness interpretation, and this view is pretty universally shared amongst biblical scholars, and even Christian scholars note the connection. A probably more accurate translation of Lilith would be succubus into modern English. But if this meaning of the word is so clear, why then do most Bibles translate Lilith as screeching owl or night monster and so on? The answer to this lies with Christian translators of later centuries. Christian translators found the concept that Lilith had a connection to the polytheistic spirits of neighboring ancient religions uncomfortable to say the least. As 1800s Christian Bible translator Wilhelm Gesenius puts it, when noting Lilith's similarities and connections to polytheistic demonesses, all this is utterly absurd when thus connected with the nature of something real mentioned in scripture. It is really lamentable that anyone could connect the word of God with such utter absurdity. Many understand the nocturnal creature spoken of to simply be the screeching owl. Essentially, he and other scholars saw the connection, but didn't like the implication it could have on his belief system. And this is something we've seen as a trend with a lot of creatures or concepts in the Hebrew Bible. Holdovers from Judaism's polytheistic days are gradually phased out by later monotheists. The reason why the translations have been so muddled over the centuries has to do with something one author has dubbed the de-demonization of the Bible, where over time Judaism or Christianity became more monotheistic. The relationship it once had with the polytheistic neighbors of its day was played down, if not attempted to be wholly removed. We've seen this with the Leviathan, we've seen this with the Nephilim. As polytheism became less cool in ancient Israel and later in Christianity, people decided to remove polytheistic references, knowingly or unknowingly, and this is exactly what happened to Lilith as well. She was turned into an owl, as opposed to the proper nookie-getting demoness she was. In summary, originally Lilith was not Adam's wife or Satan's mother, but just a type of minor desert demon which there were likely many that would haunt deserted locations, visit men in their sleep to seduce them and steal children from their families, not unlike the succubus or Krampus or similar local night spirits. She is likely just a Hebrew version of a much older demon of neighboring polytheistic religions, and this is likely the reason why she appears as a sexy evil seductress in pop culture. As for thousands of years, she was understood to be that very thing, and we just seem to have retained this memory. We are just continuing the legend in our books in movies and TV shows. However, if this is the original meaning of the word Lilith, how and when did she become associated with Satan and Adam and so on? Adam's first wife. Sometime around the 700s to 1000 CE, some Jews began interpreting that the Lilith was the woman from Genesis 1 27. So, so God, God created, created man in his own image. image. In the, in the image, image of God, God created he him. him. Male, Male and female, female created he them. them. With this woman being completely different from the woman Eve created later in Genesis 2:22, and, and the rib that, rib that the Lord God, God had taken, taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. According to this interpretation, woman was created twice by God for Adam, once out of clay at the same time as him, and second from Adam and after Adam from his rib. Folklore later goes on to say that the reason for this was that Lilith, the first woman being created from the same clay and independent from Adam, desired her own freedom and was not subservient to him, and thus left him and the Garden of Eden, and by some accounts hooked up with the archangel Samuel and later was transformed into the demoness we talked about prior. As a result of Lilith piecing out, God decided to create a second woman for Adam, a replacement, this time created from him and thus would be less independent. This was Eve. This all is not something ever explicitly stated by the Bible. Lilith is never named in Genesis. However, this interpretation of Adam having a first wife and her name being Lilith is something that persists and has been adopted for a lesser extent by Christians. So, why did early Jews think this about Lilith? Well, to start, Lilith is tied even in her most ancient form with various things associated with the Garden of Eden in the Genesis story. And to a certain extent, it appears like the ancient Sumerian text Gilgamesh Enkidu in the Netherworld could be a sort of shared origin with the Genesis tree of knowledge of good and evil narrative. Defiling a tree created by a god or goddess for one thing is something that is in both stories. Aspects of a certain of some kind are present with Lil and with possibly the key paws in Isaiah. 
Lilith seems to have already been associated with the Garden of Eden imagery, so this might be the reason why she was lumped into the Genesis creation story by some later Jews. However, what probably did do it was a huge misinterpretation of the Genesis text. As we talked about previously, and I won't go too in-depth into this video, the Bible, especially Genesis, was written by multiple authors that were spliced together into a single book. For one thing, we know that Genesis has at least two separate authors, most easily distinguished from one another for their name for God, P, which is Elohim or El, and J, which is Yahweh. These two sources wrote two separate versions of the creation story that is in Genesis that has been subsequently spliced together, and even casual readers will notice this splicing. Seriously, read your Bibles, folks. And this is why there are two versions of the flood story, or most relevant to us, two versions of the creation story. And this is why the world is created two times in Genesis, because we have two authors recounting generally the same story. However, some later Jews and Christians were not aware of this and misinterpreted the text as saying God created woman two separate times, as opposed to just two versions of the same single account. In Genesis 1.27 is P's version of the story, which goes like this. So, so Elohim, Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve created at the same time. While Jay's version is Genesis 2.22-23. And the, the rib, rib that, that the Yahweh, Yahweh had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Adam created, then Eve separately afterwards. We are not supposed to believe that Eve was created twice, nor was Lilith created and then Eve. All that is happening here are two conflicting origin stories provided by two different biblical authors, P and J, and this was probably understood in the Bible's ancient context. The Adam's first wife interpretation is actually based off of a simple mistake, a misinterpretation of the book of Genesis, because at the time, readers failed to understand that the text was not being written by one single author, rather by several being blended together. Ain't the Bible great and how confusing and complicated everything can get when you look into things deep enough? Oh, it's freaking great, and I live for this crap. Ah well, now you know what Lilith is. It's a long, complicated history just like Leviathan and Nephilim and Behemoth. Oh, I'll have to deal with that one later. Ah well, I hope you enjoyed this installment of Trade the Explainer, and hope you learned something new. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Make suggestions for me to check out stuff. I know I'll probably get back to prehistory stuff in a little bit. It's just been hard to write about. All right, goodbye. She serves the smooth red cedar. She keeps me safe and warm. It's just the calm before the storm.